It's hard to believe on a day like today that this place was a scene of chaos and destruction in four minutes that changed the landscape of this valley forever. An American cyclone in Wales, the Welsh tornado. On the 27th of October 1913, a tornado ripped the valley apart in four minutes, one unlike any seen in Wales before or since. Hundreds of people were left homeless, five people died and many injured. Join me as I follow the path of the tornado using the official Met Office report and newspaper clippings to get some sense of the chaos and destruction that happened in four minutes a hundred years ago. The Met Office report said this, the storm was a genuine tornado, the type common enough in parts of America, but fortunately of rare occurrence in this country. And the newspaper reports from that time back this up with evocative headlines that give us a clear picture of what people in this valley were experiencing. So this is the map of the tornado's route which was included in the official Met Office report and the route which we'll be following today. 11 miles, beginning in Llantbert Vadra, ending in Bedlinog. The course of the tornado was very defined and headed almost exactly due north. This means that the destruction, whilst extreme, was kept to one single route and covered a distance of about 11 miles, with winds reaching up to 160 miles an hour. The storm was first noticed at around 4pm in South Devon, on Monday the 27th of October. The first sighting of the storm that would later produce the tornado was after it crossed the channel at Aberthaw. The first recorded damage was close by, to light outdoor structures. The tornado started to develop around the Llantrisant area, here at Llantwit Vadra. At this point, the radius of the tornado was about 50 meters wide, and the strength of the wind was enough to do damage to light structures. At this point, a secondary storm began in Traforest. It caused minor damage in that area, but quickly joined up with the main storm. It was here in Kilvinid that the storm showed the violence it was capable of, giving a bleak look at the terror that was about to be unleashed up the valley. A witness testimony in the Met Office report reads this, a few seconds before 5.50pm, we heard a noise resembling the hissing of an express locomotive. The sound grew rapidly in volume, at last resembling the rushing speed of many road lorries racing along. At this point, the radius of the storm was 200 metres wide. Trees were stripped of their leaves and torn up from their roots. Gravestones were knocked over and blown around. Telegraph poles were also torn down, with one man walking down the street and being described by the press as becoming overwhelmed with telephone wires. At Kilvinath near Pontypridd, the winds were so strong that the fire station, along with a passerby, were flung into the canal. Here at Fairview Terrace, with some 60 homes had their roofs ripped off, many of the houses being completely wrecked, while the lower stories of all were filled with debris and ruined furniture. Here's a couple of bits from the local news reports the day after. Fractured limbs. A man named Blaine, his son and a servant girl were taken from the ruins of the house with fractured limbs. In another house, five children, terrified by the lightning and noise of the wind, crept under a table only a moment before the ceiling crashed in. They were eventually rescued with great difficulty. At number three Windsor Road, Abercannon, one Mrs. Taylor was sat reading in her kitchen when a gale whipped through the house and threw her across the room. The force of the wind was so strong that Mr. Taylor was pinned to his chair and unable to reach his wife to provide assistance. It was rare enough to see cars on the road in those days, but to see them flying through the air, that was something else. It was here in Abercanon that the tornado claimed its first life. The force of the wind threw Thos, Floel and Harris from the road into the nearby field with such ferociousness and his injuries so severe that he was only able to be identified several days later. Before his identity was properly revealed, he was described in the newspapers the next day only as a man of the labouring class. Newspapers also recount that a herd of cattle at a nearby farm was struck by lightning during the storm, killing several cows. There was some damage attributed to the lightning, charred walls at a farm and fresh cured tar catching a light. The lightning was, however, strong enough for people to smell. Many people reported smelling sulphur, and some were still able to smell it on their clothes days later. By the time the tornado reached Edwardsville, the storm's radius was 300 meters wide and at its most ferocious. Many people received head injuries due to falling debris. The most dangerous of all being roof tiles, which were flung about by the wind. 
Many houses were completely destroyed, as were several churches and chapels. One of these churches was being cleaned by a Mrs Wheeler and her daughters when a storm blew through. They caused the ceiling of the church to collapse onto the three women. Remarkably, they all survived, however one of the daughters went to hospital with head injuries. The school that stood here at Edwardsville was also a major casualty of the storm. This no prisoners approach by Mother Nature is a harsh reminder of the unbiased and unstoppable force that ripped through the valley. The tragic death of 15-year-old Goma Israel happened right here in the old post office. The newspaper report the next day read this. At the inquest today, it was stated that the deceased, who was 15, was the son of Isaac Israel, postmaster of Edwardsville. He was carried off his feet and dashed against the wall. His skull was fractured by falling debris. As we've been following the tornado's route today, this is the only reference I've seen to it anywhere, and it's on a board which um, gives a little bit of info about Edwardsville, this village. And there's a short paragraph, which the title of which, the Edwardsville tornado of 1913, and it ends by two lives were lost through injuries sustained by flying slates and debris. Cyclist killed, hurled by wind against telegraph pole. The death occurred at Merthyr General Hospital this morning of A. Wolford of Ton Pentra Football Club as a result of injuries sustained last night in a cyclone. It appears that Wolford was in the roadway riding a bicycle when he was caught by the force of the hurricane and buried against a telegraph pole at the side of the road. A slate then fell on his head. He was admitted to the hospital last night suffering from a fractured skull. It was here in Bedlinog where the tornado reached its climax, before fizzling out over the Lake District somewhere. It was over nearly as soon as it began. The existence of the tornado itself is remarkable enough, but it was especially strange as it travelled almost exactly due north and caused little damage outside of its narrowly defined path. According to the Met Office, it was caused by low pressure over the Atlantic and high pressure over Central Europe. Although the wind caused the greatest damage, flooding also occurred due to the extremely heavy rainfall. Around an inch of rain fell in only 30 minutes. The tornado itself only lasted around 4 minutes, but caused around £50,000 worth of damage, which is about 3 million quid today. Many houses across the South Wales valleys were destroyed, causing around 200 people to become homeless in minutes. The storm was a genuine tornado of the type common enough in parts of America, but fortunately of rare occurrence in this country. This was a particularly difficult time for nearby St. Genneth, as there was a colliery disaster in which an explosion killed 439 miners on the 14th. The rescue efforts were majorly affected by the power outages. The Met Office report states, one of the most remarkable features of the storm was the sharpness of its boundaries on either side of the track. Practically no damage was done outside the narrow limits of the course, which nowhere exceeded 1,000 feet in width. The tornado was accompanied by very severe lightning and torrential rainfall, and reached its greatest force at Abercanon and Edwardsville, where five deaths occurred. During about half an hour of calm, the atmosphere was oppressive, giving one a sense of great uneasiness and a remark was made that rain would probably ease the tenseness. Four minutes in 1913 will be forever etched in the memory of the people in this valley, with conditions not seen before or since. Let's hope it stays that way.